You're listening to Africa Business Radio, where you get up-to-date insights on the Africa business landscape. Log on to www.africabusinessradio.com. Your favorite shows are available on podcasts. Download them on our website and mobile app. Africa Business Radio, towards a profitable Africa. Africa is rising, they say, but Africa must rise with its people. There is no Africa without its people. How then do we harness Africa's wealthy people through social change and development? Social Conscience with NASA commits to Aspiration 6 of the Africa Agenda 2063 and the Global Development Goals. We advocate social change and development that will inspire the transformation that keeps Africa rising. Join us every week at 6.30 p.m. GMT plus one. Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of Social Conscious with NASA SCWN right here at the Africa Business Radio Studio in Lagos, Nigeria. I remain your host with the most, NASA. And if I sound a bit nasal, it's because uh, we just got rudely thrust into Hamatan in Nigeria, so uh, I apologize. <laughs> but on a bit of a somber note, um, Africa lost an asset yesterday. You know, the passing of John Jerry Rawlins, Ghana's ex-president, which sort of reverberated across the continent and came as a rude shock to most. He was one of the leaders that I totally admired and hoped that I would actually meet him someday. And that's not to happen anymore. May his soul rest in perfect peace. Uh, you see, we can't actually talk about Africa without speaking about Jerry Rawlins, to my mind. He epitomized anti-corruption and true statesmanship and took Ghana from... I mean, it's basically set the tone for where Ghana is today. This is my opinion. You know, anybody can argue and say what they like. But um, some of the notable things he did for Ghana and it inadvertently Africa include one, he introduced uh, free market reforms. Uh, two, he ushered in a long period of political stability after a tumultuous series of coups in the 1960s and 70s. And he campaigned for African nations to have their international debts written off. A crazy sarpong of the BBC News tells a story of him as a little child watching Jerry Rawlings on TV as an officer in military jumpsuit where he was leading a team of volunteers hammering in nails and lifting timber planks into a place to build rail tracks that needed to cart cocoa beans from farms deep inland to the harbors to end much needed export revenue. So these are some of the notable things that Jerry Rawlings did and he was um, a hands-on man obvious from this story that Equesi tells. So speaking of export revenue and economic development, you know, Africa reportedly boasts of the world's highest entrepreneurship rates. However, while entrepreneurial potential is high, the contribution to economic growth has been limited. And the big question remains why? As the conversation about entrepreneurship continues this month on Social Conscience, I'm looking forward to discussing the topic for today, which is entrepreneurship, a panacea to Africa's development gaps. I'm having this conversation with a young gentleman who's from Benin Republic. He doesn't want us to remind them that they're a republic, so he's from Benin, who is absolutely passionate about entrepreneurship and the continent. Before I invite him to join me in conversation, please stay tuned as we go on a quick break. We are the wind in the sails of your business. We are your compass. Chart your course towards your targets. Africa Business Radio. Towards a profitable Africa. Africa is rising, they say. But Africa must rise with its people. There is no Africa without its people. 
How then do we harness Africa's wealthy people through social change and development? Social Conscience with NASA commits to Aspiration 6 of the Africa Agenda 2063 and the Global Development Goals. We advocate social change and development that will inspire the transformation that keeps Africa rising. Join us every week at 6.30 p.m. GMT plus one. Welcome back. And if you're just tuning in, it's Social Conscience with NASA on Africa Business Radio. And the topic is entrepreneurship, a panacea to Africa's development gaps. According to the Africa Development Bank, 22% of Africa's working age population are starting businesses. And this is the highest entrepreneurship rate in the world. Small and medium enterprises are now the biggest formal employers in sub-Saharan Africa and will undoubtedly be key in creating the 54 million jobs that Africa is expected to create by 2022. That's just a couple of years to come. The numbers look great until one realizes that sub-Saharan Africa also has the highest small business discontinuance rate of 8.4%. While the job creation potential is promising, it's a far cry from the demands. Africa will need 122 million new jobs by 2022. Further, only 20% of African entrepreneurs are introducing new products and services. Africa has a lot of survival entrepreneurs who were pushed into entrepreneurship by unemployment. As mentioned earlier, to have this conversation with me is a gentleman from Benin who's passionate about entrepreneurship in Africa. His name is Vital Sunuvu, who holds a bachelor's degree in telecommunications and software engineering from the UIT de Calais in France and a business certificate from the University of Texas at Austin. He was listed on Forbes Africa's 30 under 30 list of 2016. His professional life spans from the annual investment meeting of the United Arab Emirates government, where he managed African relations, to the Corporate Council on Africa in Washington, D.C., and Microsoft's Johannesburg offices. He's a fellow of President Obama's Initiative for Young African Leaders, YALI, and of the Tony Alumelu Entrepreneurship Program, also Ashoka, Techstars, and Stanford Seed. Vital has an extensive experience doing trade between Sub-Saharan Africa, the United States of America, and the Middle East through trade representation deals with manufacturing companies. Since May 2012, Vital founded Expotunity Group, a fintech that facilitates B2C and B2B trade in Africa with clients such as Nestle, he is fluent in English, French, and several local languages. To my listeners, please feel free to weigh in by sending in your questions or comments to at Africa B-I-Z Radio, one word, at Africa B-I-Z Radio on Twitter with the hashtag SCWN. Bonjour, Votel. Bonjour. I'm trying my French. Uh, thank oh. you for joining me in today's <laughs> conversation. And it's a pleasure to have you as my first non-Nigerian guest. I should do a drum roll here, but I can't make noise. <laughs> so welcome. Welcome. How are you today? Hey, Tilasa. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm happy to join the show and to uh, share a bit of uh, thoughts with your audience. Fantastic. I'm looking forward to that. Thank you very much, Vital. So let's jump right into it. And I'll start with you. Your work at Expertunity and what does that mean for Africa and its entrepreneurial landscape? Uh, what it means is that there's some crazy African guy, guys out there that are convinced that every single entre- entrepreneur in Africa deserves an access to trade globally. Uh, that also means that if we are successful and we will, we, we will be successful, um, the, if you want to buy some Gary mm-hmm. from Ileife specifically, mm-hmm. and you want to buy it from a specific mama in Ileife, yeah. you can geolocate locate her and buy from her wherever you are in the world. And she mm-hmm. receive your money whether you pay for Visa, Mastercard, Verve, American Express, or any other way of paying. So that's what that's how it work. Right. That also means that some dude in Ileife will go pick up the Gary for you and deliver it to you in an Uberized manner. So that's what we do. 
Interesting. Sounds very, very techy. And I'm thinking the woman in Ilefe, is she banked, um, does she, you know, speaking to financial inclusion and access to a bank account. So how does this work for the woman selling Gary in Ilefe that doesn't have a bank account? Is it this person who delivers it to her that then collects the money on her behalf and then the issue of trust comes in? I love when you jump in right away with the, with the, with the real questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, um, um, she doesn't need to have a bank account, but her son or her nephew or her niece who is around her, who is probably young and doesn't have a job and has a smartphone okay. has one, and knows how to manage the online shop for her. That's why we share the, our profits with her niece or the young young boy around her to make sure she's successful or not. Okay. That's interesting. I see a lot of dependence on third parties. And like I said, I think one of the key things with this would be trust. So the, the woman trusts her niece or her nephew or the young person who's supposed to then sort of facilitate and use that technology. Interesting. And um, so, you know, the topic today is um, entrepreneurship as a panacea to Africa's development gaps. Should we start with what are the... So I wanted to look from an Africa perspective just because, again, you know, Africa is this huge continent with different parts. And sometimes I think that people um, sort of see Africa as a country, but it isn't. It's made up of huge parts like I mean, Nigeria is a whole can be a continent on its own. And then there's the other countries as well. Um, what what do we have in common that we think that entrepreneurship can um, be a solution to you know what what is that common problem that cuts across sub-saharan africa for instance that entrepreneurship will effectively address as has been um postulated by different you know schools of thought and all these reports that we read i mean from um from the thank you for your question i mean from from my experience mm-hmm. and also from the data we can gather online yeah um africa has a younger population in the world yeah. and it sounds to be a very um, stable parameter all across the continent. Correct. And what that youth has is is a lot of energy, a lot of potential, and most of all, the smartphone. <laughs> and <laughs> you know, you have a whole generation that was born with internet, and things is normal to be able to Google. That's true. You know? Yeah. Or else we were born a little bit earlier before Google. You know, and and they all have a different way of thinking. And, you know, they are all willing to, you know, they, they all believe that suddenly within three years, which you can do, you can become a billionaire in U.S. dollars. So you have all <laughs> these young people who are all, you know, instinctively going towards uh, digital trade, whether those who are selling on Facebook mm-hmm. or on WhatsApp or Instagram. It's a whole new generation, and that's a constant all across the continent. Right. Right. And there's a huge need. I mean, Today, yeah, we are talking about many big e-commerce marketplaces, but the, one of the best barometers of, of you know, the African youth potential yeah. is, is WhatsApp business. Um, it's, it's the largest e-commerce marketplace on the planet, oh. uh, on, on the continent, sorry. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and, and most people don't realize it. So, yeah, that's what I would say is a constant. Okay. Uh, there's a generation that believes that banking doesn't need, doesn't require a physical office. But it just requires a phone. It's a generation that believes that they, with a smartphone they can pro- offer something to the world, and and that's what's constant around the continent. No matter our differences, of course, the, every country is uh, every country has a bit of difference in terms of their GDP. Yeah, you know the the, the purchasing power of the population as a whole. For mm-hmm. example, Botswana and Benin, we are not the same. For example, of course, they have a bit more money. <laughs> 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 um, you know, the internet in Johannesburg is not the same as, as the one I would have. Clearly. So close by here, <laughs> I will not say any name. <laughs> but, but all these parameters set aside, there's still that constant, right? There's a the generation, that generation Y and mm-hmm. the generation Z mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. who are there and are going, are going to constitute the majority of our populations across the continent. 
Fantastic. So that so what I hear you say is that there's a generation of young people who are digitally savvy, energetic, and just willing to make a difference and just believe in the power of technology to just basically make a huge difference, you know, in the world, as it were. Okay, so we're united in terms of that positive area. But what about the challenges, right? So um, would you say, for instance, that... Um, Youth, so yeah, we speak about the large youth population. So youth unemployment, right? That cuts across the continent. I mean, I speak for Nigeria. I know that we have a high rate of youth unemployment. What's your take on that as youth unemployment as the common challenge that we all want to address? And maybe entrepreneurship is the answer to that. So if you, I don't know if you listened to the, when I started and it talks about entrepreneurs that are sort of forced into entrepreneurship because there's no job. So, Again, is that part of why we have the um, the high rate of discontinuation of businesses or when businesses don't last for a long time because the reasons or the origins of those businesses were faulty to start with? Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, I, your point is so valid. You know, um, you make you, you you remind me of a, of a very defining moment of my, in my life. Okay, I was sixteen, just graduated from high school. Right. I uh, wanted to make flying cars, you know, Ooh. some crazy <laughs> some things not, not going quite well in my brain. Oh, I no. Wanted to make yeah, that's a dream. Real. Okay. So, <laughs> and then, and then uh, we started uh, the science class and it, it was, uh, uh, they call it uh, digital, digital um, electronics, right. electronic so, Right. And the person walks in the, in the room and the very first thing that guy told us is, welcome, freshman. Uh, so you spend three years here, and after the three years you'll find here, you spend here, you won't find a job. Wow. That, that was so mean. Like, that, was, <laughs> that was mean, but it was great. <laughs> wow. Because 90% of us didn't find a job. 90%, that's a huge job. percentage. I mean, I still meet a lot of my classmates from 10 years ago who still don't have a job. Oh you know, yeah. who are still asking me if I know somebody who knows somebody. Wow. But the issue is that no matter how many somebodies you know, you'll never be able to find a job for all these people. And every year, there's there are, yeah, new loads of mm-hmm. graduates coming on the job market. Yeah. And there are not enough companies coming on the continent which are designed to hire people. Mm-hmm. You know, companies by definition want to fire people to make to keep more money for themselves. Of course. So by definition, the very model mm-hmm. of hoping for jobs for young people is not going to work in, in this capitalistic world. So, uh, yeah, I, what you are saying is so valid and is a constant. That's why that generation doesn't have a choice but to be entrepreneurs, right? Mm-hmm. It started from our generation, it'd be, it'd be earlier than that. The state doesn't employ anybody, yeah. and especially when you got look at Nigeria, you know the uprising that we are, we are seeing is just the beginning. I just believe it's just the I beginning. I, I hope for the best in, that everything gonna end up peacefully. Absolutely, nobody's gonna get killed. But yeah. um, uh, you know, your entrepreneurship is the only way out. If people have to, and in this digital world, it's much easier for the government to push people to go start their you know e jobs, yeah. must work to have some peace. Mm-hmm. And to try the thing, you're gonna create some. The, the, the coal industry is not working anymore. Like you're not gonna send the young people to the farm or you know yeah. to, to, to to gold mines. And mm-hmm. like that. It has to be digital work, digital jobs, right? So yeah, I overstepped a little bit the question, but okay, no, 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 absolutely. So I like the angle you bring in with you know the capitalist companies and not you know those so those capitalist organizations won't solve our unemployment problem so we have to do it internally and so there's that dependence on entrepreneurship but the question and i hear you which makes a lot of sense but those capitalist companies started off as entrepreneurs as well right so there was that staying power and there was that um, ability to just go beyond the three, four year mark that, you know, most Nigerian entrepreneurs, oh no, not Nigeria, African entrepreneurs are sort of um, associated with for whatever reasons. And we'll go into the factors later. So if we're speaking of solving, let's look at this one common problem, youth unemployment as a development gap, for instance, how can we then make entrepreneurship that sustainable solution do you see what i mean so it's it's basically yes entrepreneurship seems to be the best the the best solution but how do we then make it sustainable so that these small businesses 
you know, um, have the staying power to to then grow into the large corporates and the capitalist uh, companies that we, we try to have to hire hire our unemployed people. Do you understand? I don't know if I've gone on too long. I hope to understand quite quite a bit more. Okay. Um, the association so, between the capitalists. Okay, so you know, you talk about. Um, so there's unemployment and then the common pro- which is the common problem and you know those these capitalist companies want to also they don't want to hire as many people to keep costs down right so it's how how do we um make the most money with fewer people basically and so they're not the solution to our unemployment um challenges and that's why we need to look into entrepreneurship within you know our continent or basically within our own local um areas and so yes. how Understanding that one of the challenges of entrepreneurship on the continent is that um, that discontinuation, so the staying power, not being able to go past a certain um, mark. How sustainable is entrepreneurship as a solution, or how do we make I, I, it sustainable? I, I, I understand now. Okay, I understand now. Um, you know, this, uh, by definition, it's really. I think we are a bit hard on our on our leaders for asking them to find a solution that. Their brains are not wired to have to find. I'm not saying they're not able to, but I mean, they were born into a different world, mm-hmm. and this is a whole different world. It's changing at an exponential rate. Right. So let me take a simple example. Okay. Um, I, I, I look at some. There are some. Uh, there was some angel investor I was talking with, some fellow angel investor, and I was okay. asking him, "How was the highest amount you've invested in a startup?" Or oh, he said, I went all the way to $15,000. Wow. Right? And I was like, oh, yeah. I mean, he was really proud. And he was actually the president of the Angel Investment Association of his country. I will not mention any country. Okay. I don't want any trouble. But, <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> the thing is, but when you, when you launch a start in the U.S. or maybe in Paris, you'll sit around, you might be moving around $100,000. Right, right. Or two hundred thousand dollars, or five hundred thousand at the barest minimum. Dollars is a normal sit around in this, you know, at the at the lowest minimum yeah. for you to have a chance. And the investors need to also understand that you might fail, and they might not get your mo- their money back. Right, right, right. But the thing is that there's a huge gap on the continent. Right? Um, we've been all crying for VCs to come to the continent, but VCs are venture cap VCs, venture capital is yes. going to be the, the solution. Mm-hmm. The solution, I believe is within the communities which where the capital is. Okay. Our states cannot r- really measure the amount of capital that's available locally because people are never going to go to the government and tell them, oh, this is the amount of money I'm making. Mm-hmm. Go mm-hmm. ask an al Haji in Kano to right. show his money to the government. Let's be realistic. He's not going to show it. Right. <laughs> by, the, by definition. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, um, you know... <laughs> But it doesn't mean he doesn't have capital. Hmm. He has the capital. He can invest in most, many of the Al-Hajis I know can invest $100,000 in the small business. Su- successful. Why isn't he ready to invest? Trust. See? We'll go back to that. It's the biggest, and, 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 I, and I believe, I mean, that's the biggest gap we have on the continent now. Trust. Correct. Um, why would I trust? Just a young, uh, I, I would say, say Benin Republic, not to put the stereotype of four nine. There are four, there's four nine in, 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 in Benin Republic too. Why yeah. would I trust a young boy? I never, I don't know from anywhere. I don't know your father. I don't know his father. I don't know his mother. Right. If we run with my money, I don't know where I can go and cut, right? <laughs> and the guy comes with a brilliant idea and says, I need a bit of money to start. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? Why would I put my money to him? And that's the, the fundamental issue. There, there is no, a tier guarantee the guarantees to the people who have okay. money that they can invest their money and get their mm-hmm. money back that the money is going to come back home and, and, and that's one of the biggest challenges we have we have around here when you look at when you look carefully yeah. all the investment structures around the world are based on private capital right. when you take venture capitalists the venture capitalists they don't have the VC managers they don't have any money they go to private family private. offices Absolutely. to ask for their money mm-hmm. uh, and you give me your money, I multiply, I will invest in a few young people who have brilliant ideas. Right. 80% would fail. Mm-hmm. There's some 20% that might become an icon. That would make up right, for all the so family office. Exactly. So you say within 10 years, I get you your money back. That's the way family offices work. Mm-hmm. That's because, you know, and it's private capital. Right. You need to have friends, families, and full investing in small businesses around the continent mm-hmm. to allow them to get to the size 
where some bigger funds can might come in. Right. And again, that's a whole different topic we might talk about Absolutely. in a different in the conversation. You're right. They have to be careful in the term sheets they are signing for mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because at the end, which company is going to remain African? 80% of the startups financed on the African continent are not run by Africa. This is very and true. And 20%. This... Yes. You know, I mean, we don't have sovereignty on our ideas and in the next 20 years, we're going to be crying because there will be no African startup that's going to be owned by Africans. Wow. So that's a whole different issue. So people who are not from Africa cannot design their their capital and orient their capital in a direction to allow the continent to be independent. So we have to use our capital smartly and make sure we keep some sovereignty and promote local ideas. Oh, okay, it is. Fantastic. You know what, it's interesting that you talk about 80% of, you know, the companies that are financed are not actually run by Africans. And this is something that's come up in a conversation with someone I was having and it's quite, it was just quite alarming. And, and I guess that's going to be a topic for another day. But you know what, let's just stay on course. I'm going to then speak to, um, so looking at the Africa Continental Trade Agreement, you know, there's been, well, there's, it's reportedly supposed to have some huge benefits. And one of which is, you know, um, an increase in real wages for unskilled workers in agricultural and non-agricultural sectors. Um, and also basically a shift in employment expected from agricultural to non-agricultural sectors. What do you think the AFCTA means for our entrepreneurship or entrepreneurial landscape, given the high business discontinuity rate. So it's one thing to say that the AFCTA will um, provide these sort of opportunities, but then we can't ignore these challenges that we've also talked about. So how can we truly harness these benefits? So um, this is a very delicate, sub- delicate subject because okay. um, I happen to know a few of the people <laughs> working on the- on, on both sides, so okay. I will just try to be very careful in the way I phrase. I have a political my, answer my to this one. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> no, the thing is, um, mm-hmm. the African Future Agreement is the, one of the greatest ideas, you know, of, of our, our century. Right. And I think if we don't integrate, we're gonna die. As mm. simple as that. I mean, mm-hmm. we would be stupid. And we have been quite a bit of time, but yes. we could change that dynamics now, right? Um, it would be stupid not to implement it. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, uh, Ambassador, uh, Commissioner Mushanga has been doing a fantastic job with his right. team. Also, the African Bank has been heavily involved mm-hmm. financing that transition towards a more free trade between African countries. But, but still, they can only do so much. We have to deal with the individualities of our, of our country, Correct. local interests. When I look at, for example, Africa's biggest market, where is that? It's Nigeria. Yep. Let's just face it. Right? That's right. Nigeria, well, Nigeria, and funny enough, I don't know why Benin Republic were the two last countries. I don't know why. I mean, we are. I think we are full of our elder brother. <laughs> but, but, but even still, that was uh, the African Federation that like, was supposed to, to come into action, uh, you know, since uh, last July, I, I believe. But COVID-19 came in and mm-hmm. just destroyed all the plans. Right. But that set aside, the opportunity and the lining and from, from that federal agreement is huge. Mm-hmm. That's our chance as Africans to be able to own our market. That's right. Because I move around, I'm, I'm, I'm into B2B trade. I, I, I play that game most of the time with my collaborators and partners. I take a product and I say, where was it made? Mm-hmm. Oh, Turkey. Okay, this one, where was it made? Wow. Oh, China. Well, how about this one, mm-hmm. France? How about this one? I mean, and when you are spending your money away, yeah. you're getting poorer. Of so, course. Um, and we have to trade with Africans. It's, it's, it's our survival depends on it. If you don't buy African, your kids are going to die. You're going to be poor. Your kids are going to be poor. It has to be clear. Be put in the mind of Africans the way Chinese understand the way Americans understand Trump, I'm not for anybody yeah. <laughs> to whomever is elected. Mm-hmm. But uh, if you don't buy local, mm-hmm. your local ecosystem economy dies. Mm. And 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 I, even though my country suffered from the whole Nigeria trying to lock, lock their border, we got open the border. We have to chop. But. <laughs> <laughs> I still do understand the necessity of protecting one's economy. Of course. 
Again, but still looking at each other as island nations and trying to protect small interests. Nigerians are gonna benefit. Nigerian factories are gonna benefit from selling, selling to Cote d'Ivoire, selling to Morocco, of selling course. to, to Egypt, wider market. Selling. Mm-hmm. We have, yeah, we have to be bold and confident enough to know that competition is healthy. Competition is gonna allow our dormant factories to innovate. Very and true. be able and be able to to compete, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I'd rather a competition between Africans than a competition with the rest of the world. Yeah, because we clearly have lost that that team missed that train a long time ago. So it's a, our opportunity to uh, the seat. Great. So. Um Speaking to still the Africa, you know, um, consensual trade agreements and the sort of opportunities. So if I were a young person and I'm looking to go into some sort of business, I'm trying to be strategic about it. So outside of, because I know you talk, you talk to technology. What are the other sectors that yeah. I should be looking at and to sort of then start a business? I think I know the, this, this usual suspects already, but I'll leave that to you to share. You might be surprised. You might be surprised. <laughs> Tell me, try me. Um, um, I, I, I think technology is great. Okay. Uh, it's a tool to manage information, mm-hmm. to, to trade it, to exchange it. Um, but at the end, it's people. It's people mm. using information in, in certain ways. So um, I, I, I think it's transversal. Uh, you know the common uh, link between all sectors. I think all sectors are still valid, but only those that cannot be automated. So I would okay. give, I'll give an advice to. It depends also, and, and, and I really I'm, I'm, a, I'm a real advocate for Africans trying to build a company that will last. Mm-hmm. Them. Mm-hmm. Them just and, and buy some Nike. You no, know, uh, are your kids going to be able to see your company? Yes. Right. Are your grand are your kids still gonna be around when you're gone, when your kids are gone, when your grandkids are gone. The the, the oldest company in the world is Congo Gumi, the Japanese company, they are one thousand three hundred something years. Yeah. Transmitted within within forty nine generations. Why can't we do that? Most exactly. of the time after the second I know I have a few friends who inherited some factories in Nigeria. <laughs> from from there from the from the, the, the daddy yes. and when they came back abroad from abroad and they wanted to take over that company they realized that it was a one man show I mean our daddies I don't have anything else, <laughs> I respect them but you know, more governance structures it's really hard succession plans. for you know for the transition to happen so the reason I'm talking about that coming back to your to your question yes it it is very important. Mm-hmm. That we make sure that everything we are building is going to endure in time. That's and you true. have to look at sectors that are not going to die. Agriculture, people are still going to have, gonna always gonna need to eat. That's right. But, but when you go back to the farm, don't be showing, try to show off that, okay, yeah, I'm a patriot, I'm going back to the farm and go back with your, your old your uh, middle aged and- tools, right? <laughs> yeah. Try to use a drone. Use mm-hmm. your smartphone. Yeah. Add to a bit of technology. You know, mm. all these drones and things people are doing are not that complicated. There's always a younger engineer who can do it, but it's also it's very important. No matter the field that's chosen to incorporate technology into it, technology can be applied to everything. That's right. But it's really for African young people to stop a survivalistic business, mm-hmm. but really embark into businesses. They're gonna feed them, feed their kids, feed their grandkids, and, and vice versa. We need strong companies, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a real advocate for that. People need to dare to dream big. I mean, Nigeria is a good place also to dream big because there's a lot of <laughs> private jets there. But you can, you also need to show people that you don't need to have a grandfather who was Dantata or I'm not yeah. mentioning anybody. You, know, you don't need to have a, <laughs> yeah. a father who has a name mm-hmm. to own a private jet. That's you know, That's you true. should be able. You don't need to be a pastor to be to own a private jet. <laughs> okay. So other path. Yeah. You can start your own business online and strive to do something big and apply to a sector where you can be you can be a leader. Hmm. So that's the, yeah. I've been a bit long on that one, but it's important to think about. So yeah, e-commerce is not the only thing. E-commerce applies to everything. Yes. But it's important also to be specific 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so I see you make a lot of reference to Nigeria and businesses. You know how you know you're, you're, you. So you you did a, a bit of name dropping there as well. <laughs> <clears throat> so my question though is, <laughs> if you're looking at and with your experience and exposure, is this true for other African countries? So does this sort of um, poor succession plan um, also exist in other African countries? And maybe the answer to that is obvious because, again, how many countries on the continent do we know of that have, you know, outlived the founders? Um, so, yes, yeah, so what, what's your experience with this? And or is this something peculiar to certain countries? Um it's, hmm, I'll, I'll be careful in the way I say this. <laughs> You're being careful a lot. <laughs> you know, you have some... <laughs> yes, because, you know, um, when you take some countries like Ethiopia, for example, they control the economy. Ethiopia right. is owned by Ethiopians. Yes. You go to Tanzania, Tanzania is owned by Tanzanians. That's right. right. Nigeria seems to be owned by Nigerians. Well, it's not quite... So, um... <laughs> uh, that's what I <laughs> Right, um... But in certain countries, the culture also has a huge influence in the way businesses are transmitted. When you go into the into the Hausa community, there are a lot of wealth that mm-hmm. have been transmitted from generation to generation. So yes. I, I don't think the generational wealth transmission is something that's foreign to Africa. There are some ethnicities who have done a good job with it. And we just need to be humble enough to go to them and, and, and you know, politely ask, how did you do it? Okay. Right? Um, so I think it's something that has, it, it's, you know, Africa, we are not countries yet. I mean, some countries are becoming countries now, nations, but we are most of all, we are Yorubas, we are, you I know, know. We, are Ibos, yes. we are we are, we are ethnicities at first. Yes. Some ethnicities have kept some certain cultures. Mm. Some cultures have been successful at certain things. Right. And I think we just need to learn from them. So we don't need to replicate a very uh, Western um, tra- wealth transmission pattern, which mm-hmm. would, it would be great to learn from. Yes. But when I take it around the continent, South Africa is, 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 is with wealthy people, wealthy relatively young in South Africa. You're still in first generation black people with black owned wealth. That's a lot true. of old, gener- many gener- several generation white owned wealth yeah. in South Africa. But in, in, in Arab countries, it's, very, it's been very hard. You know, every time there's a bit of an ego, ego from the founder mm-hmm. and a, a, a bit of an egotistic culture, wealth right. transmission is not successfully done. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a factor that we have to keep in mind. That's a you very know, strong for factor. For us, uh, mm-hmm. our, our generation, yeah, we need to remove the ego and understand that a kid who is 14 is probably smarter than you because he, has, he was born with Google. They were not. (laughs) (laughs) So it's important to keep that in mind. We have to be humble enough to trust that the young, the the younger generations Mm -hmm. are smarter than us and are going to be better than us. And that's the way why we should, we should do it. So yeah, across the continent uh, is something that's valid. We need to remove the ego of the founder and realize the company is not you. You're building an institution that's supposed to Feed your 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 employees, your shareholders, if you have some, yes. and also that they be careful. Oh, it's important. I want to point that out. Yes, many African companies, startups. There's this big fashion about startups where people are so obsessed with going to raise funds. Yeah, there's, there's so much more. Um, uh, you know, applause that's given to the guys who's raising capital. Mm-hmm. Oh, he just raised one million dollars, yep. two million dollars yep. from this VC. Yep. But, what if you just you read do? the terms of the contract? Because most of them don't, they don't own their companies anymore. They don't own anything. I mean, they are uh, just employees. Yeah, they're just, employees. You're just congratulating someone for taking up their I mean, idea and running who, with it. I mean, someone who used to own his business and yes. certainly is not owning it anymore is definitely gonna, not going to transmit it to his kids. I'm not saying. The startup model is not bad. There are some good examples. Yeah. Like this guy got the the the, the now. But they sold their power to a certain end they may not be very African. And mm. all that genius is not Africa anymore. They have the cash. Congratulations. Yes. But how but about that power? How about all that profit that's gonna be generated in the future? Where is it not going to come to? back from the continent? That's interesting that you point so that we out. Need to, we need, I mean we, 
I personally, I refuse to take VC money. I'm not interested in them. Mm-hmm. Uh, the moment I started reading the terms and I realized what they wanted, what they're trying the to money, do. bootstrapping mm-hmm. is better. the best way to raise capital is to sell, sell product, make right. new product and sell. Mm-hmm. Uh, they need to, and also, and and. And I want to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm specific to your question yes. about how do we make sure wealth is transmitted. Yes. Stop selling your shares. Keep them. Grow your company. Or if you want to sell them, sell them in the family. Hmm. Or in the, you know, in the country. So just it's keep it, keep it. Because at least the money is going to stay around. Yes, it's not going out. Wow, that's interesting. Very interesting insights there. Um, and these VCs. And you see, when you say that, I know that there's just this craze. It's like, like, you know, if you haven't raised the funds, people don't think that you started anything. And then there's all this fanfare about raising the funds and nobody asked the big questions. And then what happens after is we start to hear these stories of not meeting the terms and conditions of the VCs. And then everything comes out in the open. You're like, oh, that's what's going on. You know, so people need to be more, uh, should I say more attentive and, um, but then there's still, the, I mean, the reason they go to the visas is not because I wouldn't, you know, it, it's not because they, I don't think they want to, they don't want to source funds locally. Like we've mentioned earlier, how many local investors are willing to actually invest in the businesses? So that the, there needs to be some sort of shift there as well. GC. Um, Jinasa, yes, I, I tend, I will like, we'll have to agree to disagree. Okay. Because there's investment happening every day for the past hundreds of Locally? years. Yoruba moms <laughs> in the market transmitting the, the stock to their daughter, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, lending money to each other's Igbo people who are importing goods, who have been doing it for generations. Yes. Look at the Bamileke, their money is going mm-hmm. through ethnicities. We have, we might not like it. We might like to think that we suddenly be, stop becoming, becoming, uh, being ethnicities and became countries. Yes. But we are not. We are still ethnicities. I'm more likely to give money to a women guy from my women region than to someone who is from another women. That's a fact. Hmm. So when young people are trying uh, running behind a VC, hopefully we're going to come with his terms. Mm-hmm. Most of the time, uh, it's going to point out the VC has never sold a pen in his life. Mm-hmm. Doesn't know how to create a company. Correct. Never created one. Never, yes. you know, raise capital himself. Never run a business. Okay, if you're still listening, we're on Social Conscience with NASA and the topic that I'm discussing today is entrepreneurship as a panacea to Africa's development gaps. And with me is Vital Sunuvu from Bene, who's talking about his experiences, just being exposed to different businesses and transactions across the continent and also shedding light on some of the challenges that the continent is faced with looking at the entrepreneurial landscape. Um I'm going to go on a quick break if you just stay with me and we'll be back shortly. You're listening to Africa Business Radio, where you get up-to-date insights on the Africa business landscape. Log on to www.africabusinessradio.com. Your favorite shows are available on podcasts. Download them on our website and mobile app. Africa Business Radio, towards a profitable Africa. Africa is rising, they say. But Africa must rise with its people. There is no Africa without its people. How then do we harness Africa's wealth in people through social change and development? Social Conscience with NASA commits to Aspiration 6 of the Africa Agenda 2063 and the Global Development Goals. We advocate social change and development that will inspire the transformation that keeps Africa rising. Join us every week at 6.30 p.m. GMT plus one.
Welcome back. We're still on social conscience with NASA. The topic for today is entrepreneurship as a panacea to Africa's development gaps. And like I mentioned earlier, the guest with me today is Vital Sunuvu from Benin. Um, so Vital, we lost you for a few seconds there and welcome back. Thank you. I'm back now. Fantastic. Okay. So let's just carry on. Um, I think that we left off around some questions that I, I, I think we ended up talking about the, um, what capital transmission and basically the openness of local investors. And you had a different view from me saying that, you know, there's, there's money locally. It's just, um, available within what people just would rather fund their own, right? Or support their own. So we're still looking at ethnicities as opposed to a country. Okay. But, um, I'd like to ask a question around, um, so looking at Benin or Benin, <laughs> what would you, what, what are the entrepreneurs in Benin looking to do to drive sustainable growth? Because as it appears, obviously there's this dependence on Nigeria and you talked earlier about how about 90% of the people that you graduated with are still looking for work. So is, is entrepreneurship something that these people are turning to and in terms of just looking for it and growing the economy sustainably, what are the things that they should be looking at or they're, they're looking at? Um, entrepreneurship has, has, uh, from my generation, 10 years ago, you know, when we started, it has become kind of the, Evident path for for most young people I've met here, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, I, I think it has become an evidence. Uh, people are instantly turning to entrepreneurship. People, there's no job anyway, and those <laughs> yeah. who have a job don't have a life. Yeah, and are not making much money. So mm-hmm. and then there's more, there are more and more uh, people who are doing some drop shipping or selling online. Even the ladies in the market, like they're all selling online. They all have a WhatsApp account. They have Facebook pages. I mean, I work with them a lot. They're yeah. not, they are really smart. They are, <laughs> they're in this tech thing too. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, that, that's what I can say about the need. The need has become um, very digitized in mm-hmm. terms of trade. Right. Uh, it's evident for, for most, most, the majority of the population that trade can be done digitally and the entrepreneurship is the, is the go-to the way. way forward so, there, there's less shame yeah like t- 10 years ago when you show up and start to, to sell some beers even if it's some big cans people will start thinking ah you went all this to, to school all this way and now you're selling beer mm-hmm. <laughs> <What happened>? <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> but but now they do understand that yeah. entrepreneurs tend to have a bit more you know liquidity more, than, yes and then there's a respect. Great, so, okay. Yeah. Um, then, so let's now go back to Africa and just sort of trying to speak to. Now I've lost my train of thought, so I was going to ask a question around. Okay, yes. So I look at Nigeria. I look at South Africa. Can we put um, or let's say Benin, for instance? Can we? So yes, we've identified the common problems and the common strengths that we have. But then just in terms of when we talk about longevity and the discipline and the the country that you think shows more stronger potential for having or growing this kind of sustainable businesses, which countries would that be? Would you say South Africa, for instance? Because there's the structure. (laughs) I mean, that's a very risky question because you just mentioned the three countries that that fit me. So (laughs) some of the three countries that fit me, I I do have businesses in Nigeria, businesses in in South Africa. So I cannot take sides. No, don't take sides. Just say say as it is. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think I think every country has different things to offer, right? Mm-hmm. When you you look at South Africa, for example, um, there's this new wave of extremely talented young people who have, who have been to school, mm-hmm. you know, who are the, the the generation after Mandela, and you know, it's still hard for them. Many of them are trying to be entrepreneurs, uh, and and they have many advantages right now. Yeah. The government is much more pro pro uh, black people. Exactly. So if you're black in South Africa now, it's, mm-hmm. it's a good time to be black in South Africa. 
uh, and a good time to be black in many, many places in the world too. Uh, uh, when, when, but the South Africans don't really have the, I mean, I would say, um, uh, native black South Africans, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think is a, is, a, is a bit of a new culture. Yes. That more and more people are embracing. And, 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 and also generationally, you know, when you look at the, in South Africa, I'm going to close in South Africa real quick after this one. Um, they have not been encouraged to think in a business fashion. They were not bred, I would say, to, to be entrepreneurs. They were, they were groomed and, and, and educated to be employees and dependent the, on, you know, right, gotcha. mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a new learning curve. Right. For, you know, a new cultural shift that's happening in South Africa. And I right. think they have look, all the chances towards that. Mm-hmm. And many of them are also understanding that the South African market is not enough. That uh, South Africa is in Africa. Uh, there is not uh, South Africa and then Africa because they call us Africans. <laughs> they call themselves they call <laughs> South Africa. Themselves South Africa. They need to understand that There's a actually they are in this Africa thing. They need to <laughs> think a bit broadly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but when you look at Nigeria, I mean, Nigeria is the country of entrepreneurs. You cannot teach anything to Nigeria except from discipline. But I mean, Nigerians. Did you say except? For, mean, did you say discipline? The, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, that's so, fine. I mean, but you said that because you know it's important to note what the challenges are and be honest with ourselves so that we can actually find lasting solutions. And the reason I asked that, and I guess the question I essentially was asking was, basically, which countries have that? enabling environment and we know the challenges we have in Nigeria we know the and then you've just mentioned some in South Africa you know I mean to be honest there's no place like to reach and teach entrepreneurship like Nigeria I mean to be honest like there's no place I'm from Benin but there's no place we can teach entrepreneurship like Nigeria Mm -hmm. Nigeria you learn to hustle I mean there's no and I've never seen a a stupid Nigerian there's no stupid Nigeria. <laughs> like, there's, like, like, there's no, like, the country is designed not to build, we're, you know, to We're designed to survive. To build business mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, Nigerian, because now we're talking about Nigeria, Nigeria have more, much, a bit more advantage, uh, right. uh, than you have the advantage of, of the number. Right. You also have the advantage the given by the oil in the past where in, a lot of Nigerians went to Houston in Texas and, Send their kids to the higher schools. Mm-hmm. The Nigerian diaspora is the most educated diaspora in the United States. That's true. For example, mm-hmm. you know, there's more Nigerian in, in, in Harvard than Chinese in Harvard. Maybe they should make, we have to rename Harvard or something. <laughs> make it Nigerian. Well, I don't know. Let them hear but you. you guys have all this. <laughs> You know, <laughs> maybe you guys should should uh, should buy Harvard something. Trump's not good if you uh, happy but, to hear that. Um, <laughs> This vast wealth of knowledge in mm-hmm. terms of moving a business from, you know, the sub, 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 uh, survival business, survival, survivalistic businesses okay. that our, our, our fathers, our mothers have built mm-hmm. and push them to an, the next level right. of having African tycoons which are actually conquering the world. That's right. <clears throat> you know, there's no African company today that was birthed in Africa. It has conquered other continents and everybody's applauding. Oh my God, these Africans, they're taking over the world. No African company doing that. Correct. And that, I think, is due to education. And mm-hmm. I think it's hard time that we have our own tycoons, you know? Our tycoons don't have to always be in cement or in oil, no, or, or in diamond. That's or, true. No. They can be in tech too. In tech too. That's and I'm right. talking real tycoons. I'm not talking, and I'm not talking selling for small millions. I'm talking companies that decide to survive mm-hmm. until they make billions and billions of dollars in the show yeah. to Africans that it's possible because nobody has really trailed that, that blaze so far. Fantastic. Thanks, thanks, Vital. So, um, we, you know, we're, the show is about to end and we're going to round up very quickly. Um, if you just take one minute to, um, share to my um, listeners like in terms of our conversation and what you think is important that they should live with or you want to leave them with um, you want to raise capital first thing don't don't go to the guy in, in, the, in the suit mm-hmm. he doesn't have the money himself it's not his money he never built a company he doesn't know how it works Correct. have the humility to go to the market mm-hmm. ask the mama who has millions and millions of dollars in cash and be humble enough, mm-hmm. respect her, and convince her that your business makes sense. She has the money; she can give it to you. So, 
you know, you know, long PowerPoints may not finance you that. <laughs> I like that. Um, I want to say that. And second thing, it's a matter of survival right. for us to protect our companies and our innovations. Mm-hmm. No time bef- has ever occurred like now right. where a single individual can have an idea and change the lives of billions and billions of people. Mm -hmm. And there are many Africans who are coming with brilliant ideas. Those ideas to stay in Africa. Fantastic. Right. Yeah. So don't build to sell. Build to grow so that you can transmit to your kids and create value in your country. So those are the two things that I would love to. Fantastic. I like build. build, Yeah. So don't build to sell, build to outlive your current existence and basically build to transfer to generations and one. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Vital. Thank you for your time. It's been a very insightful conversation. And to my listeners at home, wherever you are, I'm just going to close with this. When you decide to create and add value to make a difference, then you're well underway to becoming an entrepreneur that's built to adapt and last. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been another insightful conversation with Mr. Sunuvu. Thank you very much for staying tuned. We will continue to discuss entrepreneurship in Africa this month of November in light of the Global Entrepreneurship Week. Please tune in for another insightful conversation. Same time, same station next week. I am yours conscientiously. Africa is rising, they say, but Africa must rise with its people. There is no Africa without its people. How then do we harness Africa's wealth in people through social change and development? Social Conscience with NASA commits to Aspiration 6 of the Africa Agenda 2063 and the Global Development Goals. We advocate social change and development that will inspire the transformation that keeps Africa rising. Join us every week at 6.30 p.m. GMT plus one. You're listening to Africa Business Radio, where you get up-to-date insights on the Africa business landscape. Log on to www.africabusinessradio.com. Your favorite shows are available on podcasts. Download them on our website and mobile app. Africa Business Radio, towards a profitable Africa.